Excellent. Well, my name is Ted Burgess. I'm the Vice President of Sales for Inverid. I uh, wanted to thank everybody for joining today. We're going to talk about um, HLRs, HVAC load reduction devices, and the indoor air quality procedure. Um, basically, what we do at Inverid is we're not a new company or a new technology, but we basically enable reduced outside air for ventilation purposes by scrubbing the return air as opposed to um, using outside air to dilute contaminants within space. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about the product. And we will, yep. Mm -hmm. Just a second, I just, just before we get started, 100% uh, here, I just wanted to give people yeah. a bit of a uh, rundown. So in, in the webinar here, uh, thanks everybody for joining. Um, this is Nathan speaking from Odella, so it's, it's sorry to interrupt. Uh, to just want to let everybody know that if they have a question, there is a uh, question bubble on the right-hand side of your screen. Uh, just click there and type in your question. I'll be monitoring that throughout the presentation. Uh, mostly, there are a number of people in this webinar, so uh, we'll save most of the question and answer till the end, um, and then we'll go from there. So, um, Ted, go ahead. Sorry, take it away. Excellent. Yeah, thanks so much. Um, so, here we have a quick agenda about what we'll discuss today. Obviously, um, one thing that's on the top of everyone's mind is, is viral contamination and COVID as well, so we'll touch on that briefly also. Um, but basically, um, Inverid works closely with Adele, Adele Associates in all of Ontario to provide HVAC load reduction devices for the purposes of outside air reduction and to treat indoor air quality as well. Um, a little bit about Inverid right off the bat. We were founded in 2010, so we're not a new company or a new technology, but um, have been doing this for about a decade. Our headquarters is in Boston. We've got about 30 employees. We have units deployed worldwide, including in Ontario as well, and all across the East Coast um, and across the world as well. Our expertise really is in removing contaminants from indoor air, like CO2, formaldehyde, et cetera, um, with no byproducts. So that's a huge uh, differentiator for us, um, is that we produce no byproducts. There's the box there that we manufacture on the left. It's uh, two feet by four feet by six feet. Uh, each one of these units treats approximately 15,000 square feet of space, or essentially the equivalent of um, uh, basically 150 to 180 occupants worth of CO2 within a within a office building, school, et cetera, which are standard applications. Basically, any standard building where occupancy is driving outside air calculations. Um, and you can see there the that we're a side stream air scrubber, so our device is not. 100% of the return air, we're treating essentially just a small portion of it. Um, that enables us to keep your downstream systems like your air handlers and whatnot uh, of the same fan sizes. Um, the net result of deploying our systems is that we're able to reduce outside air requirements by 60 to 80%, and you see the OPEX and uh, CAPEX savings as a result of that as well. Primary driver behind our success recently across the world is that in 2019, we got first place in the green building category at ASHRAE. Um, and we also got first place in all categories, winning product of the year as well. And it was great to have ASHRAE validation surrounding our ability to remove CO2, formaldehyde, and the full range of VOCs from indoor air. Um, the Inverted HLR was also ranked by the U.S. Department of Energy as a top three technology for commercial buildings as well, where they validated a lot of our installations in the south, uh, in the middle of the U.S., and um, validated that we showed 22 to 35 percent energy savings across HVAC systems by reducing outside air. Phenomenal recognition there from the U.S. Department of Energy. We also have, at this point, over 170 unique MEPs designing our systems into various buildings across North America. Um, you can see some of our marquee clients there, as well as some engineering firms at the bottom of the screen that are currently using us in, in different applications. So some familiar names there in the Ontario area. Just a little bit about ASHRAE 62.1. For those who are not familiar, ASHRAE 62.1 essentially has two sections um, to calculate how much outside air is required for buildings. One is the ventilation rate procedure, um, which is what most of us are familiar with, uh, which is a prescriptive methodology for figuring out how much outside air to bring into a building uh, to remove contaminants that are emitted within the space. So off-gassing from furniture or CO2 emissions from individuals, 
and using outside air to essentially flush out that air. Um, the other, which is until recently lesser known, is the indoor air quality procedure, where you deploy indoor air cleaning, uh, which enables you to reduce uh, the amount of outside air required. It's essentially a substitute for outside air by removing all the contaminants that are emitted within the space. ASHRAE 62.1 is referenced in Ontario Building Code, also referenced in the International Mechanical Code 403. Um, so both of these sections apply equally within um, code so that you don't need to apply for variances if you're using indoor air cleaning um, in the indoor air quality procedure as opposed to ventilation rate. Here's um, kind of the breakout text there off to the right. You can see that air cleaning strategies are used within the indoor air quality procedure within ASHRAE 62.1. And an interesting note there in the bottom right hand corner that says, the indoor air quality procedure may also be used to achieve better air quality than ventilation rate procedure. And we see this frequently in metropolitan areas, like for example, I'm based out of Washington, D.C. You can see at the bottom of your screen there, uh, bringing in outside air may not be a great solution uh, for treating indoor air because you've got 24 hour particle pollution, uh, a C grade there with Washington, D.C., you've got an F grade for ozone. And the EPA has given us an eight hour ozone classification for non attainment where uh, I'm based on it. So, um, dilution is not necessarily the solution for removing a lot of the contaminants within this uh, indoor spaces. So, when do you use indoor air quality procedure? Most frequently, we use it if outside air is polluted, uh, which is in many major metropolitan areas at this point. Buildings with existing capacity limitations. So, we do a lot of work with like WeWork, for example, or Regis, where they might be moving into a single floor on a building. They might have high occupant density, but not be able to upgrade the overall building's HVAC to accommodate that increased occupant density. By deploying the Inverit HLR, you can meet code requirements without actually having to increase the amount of outside air that you're bringing in. We also look at a lot of new buildings that might have limited HVAC capacity or budgetary concerns with the size of equipment that's initially recommended. So a great VE option. Um, if you're looking to decrease cost on a project and downsize a chiller plant, for example. Um, buildings in cold or hot climates um, are great applications because we can reduce greenhouse gases and allow for a kilowatt hour reduction because it costs less to heat or cool air if you're bringing in a lower volume of total air. And then by removing CO2 and all these other contaminants, um, the Inverid solution is actually uniquely able to achieve up to 16 lead points under the EQPC 124 lead pilot credit. We'll go deeper into that. And we're also eligible to get well points as well through the well building standard. I wanted to talk just kind of industry wide a little bit about ventilation rate procedure changes in 2019. Um, they redefined a little bit what unusual sources are. Um, and became more clear that the ventilation rate procedure is based on contaminant sources and source strengths that are typical for standard occupancy categories. So for sources that are not typical of the occupancy, additional ventilation or air cleaning must be done using the indoor air quality procedure. An unusual source in this case is designed as an item or activity that can create or emit contaminants that occur rarely within an occupancy category. So for example, if you're building a school next to an office, uh, excuse me, if you're building a school next to an airport where outside air might be contaminated, the intent of ventilation rate procedure is not to bring in all that contaminated outside air into that school. The intent as referenced here in 6.2212 under source strengths would actually to be uh, to use the indoor air quality procedure and air cleaning um, to be more in line with outside air reductions for ventilation in 2019. Very interesting. Um, and good to have that clarity from ASHRAE as well. Um, additionally, for demand control ventilation, there was an addendum to 62.1 uh, that basically says that sensors shall be factory calibrated and certified by the manufacturer uh, not more frequently than once every five years. So getting a little bit more specific, on the uh, frequency of calibration for sensors and the requirements surrounding demand control ventilation. The indoor air quality procedure is actually a fairly straightforward procedure. Don't be scared of that calculation up there at the top. Um, we'll walk through it very quickly here. It's very simple, but basically 
Uh, the first two parts of that equation, NDT and the dilution component, is essentially what you're doing with ventilation rate procedure. Ashram uh, knows emission rates within space types of CO2 and VOCs based on occupancy in the type of space that it is, based on decades of, of studies that they've done on emission rates of furniture and um, human emissions of CO2. Um, and what we do right now is we know that emission rate, we bring in a certain volume of outside air to dilute those containers. The only thing the indoor air quality procedure does with this mass balance equation is you uh, then have another lever to pull, which is basically air cleaning. So you have one more thing in addition to bringing in outside air for the purposes of pressurizing the building. You can use air cleaning to help remove some of those emissions as well. And a certain quantity of HLRs. HLR stands for HVAC load reduction device. You use a certain quantity of HLRs. You know the efficiency, EF, of those devices um, because you've done ASHRAE 145.2 testing on their ability to remove CO2, formaldehyde, and all the other COCs. And then you've got CBZ, which is your indoor concentration. You set the concentration limit on each of these contaminants. Um, and ASHRAE has actually published guidance as well as the lead. So if you're going for the lead points, um, they publish. Uh, what the maximum limits of formaldehyde or CO2 may be, for example. And that's how you figure out how much outside air you can actually reduce and how many air cleaning devices you need. Ted, pretty cool. Mm -hmm. Can I interrupt you here for a second, Ted? Yeah. Uh, getting a lot of feedback from the audience that uh, you're, you're cutting in and out on audio, like, like you're moving uh, closer and further from the mic. Okay, okay, no problem. Yeah, I'll just uh, stare, stare right into it there. I'll keep an eye on that uh, audio bar. Great, thanks. Excellent, thank you. Excellent. So why use the Inverid HLR? So um, this is a very unique product in the fact that it's completely 62.1 compliant. Um, our goal is to show first cost savings uh, versus demand control ventilation or energy recovery. Um, there are available custom rebates um, to help cover some of the system cost. And uh, there are operational savings by reducing outside air. There is a small maintenance component behind our unit that you do have to replace the cartridges once a year um, to uh, um, essentially just like any other filter, except our replacement is just once a year. Um, and that's really the only maintenance that's required. Um, as I mentioned before, there's uh, lead points, up to 16 lead points, and we've got proven tested data by the Department of Energy, ASHRAE, and utilities surrounding this product as well. This is an example of one of those tests. It's the ASHRAE 145.2 test for gaseous contaminant removal. Um, this is basically for ozone, where you can see that regardless of elevated concentration levels, over time, our efficiency of removing that contaminant remains consistent. Pretty neat. Here's a little bit more of a um, more lengthy list. It's still a partial list of contaminants that remove, uh, we remove in our efficiencies. And you can see at the top of the screen there um, the HLR's cartridges. That's a, essentially a very robust filter filled with a sorbent. It's about an inch thick, it's two feet wide by two feet tall, and there's 12 of those per unit. Um, and basically these are what are removing the contaminants of concern from uh, the air that we're scrubbing from the return air. Okay. One thing that's top of mind for many folks right now is COVID, obviously. Um, so I wanted to touch on that with a little bit of a, bit of a uh, disclaimer. I'm not a doctor. Um, these are just data points that I've gathered from uh, relevant resources um, based on their, their outputs. Um, so none of this should be taken as guidance, but rather just reference points for you to do additional research on. But um, a little bit of a local study here from University of Toronto, um, basically for COVID-19 and safety. So for those of you who are wondering about viral contamination and how it relates to HVAC systems, there's no direct evidence of filtration benefits to COVID-19 exposure. Okay, Ionizers, ozone generators, plasma, and other air cleaning technologies. Um, have not been proven to reduce infection rates in real buildings, even if they have promises based on tests and labs and other idealized settings. And then some of those devices have substantial concerns about secondary issues. As I referenced before, Inverid is a sorbent 
based air cleaner. So we're not one of these devices. We're essentially a very robust filter and we produce no byproducts. Um, and then most public health guidance has to do with large droplets like from sneezing or interpersonal contamination, which is why social distancing is recommended and air filtration is only a very small part of the solution here. Um, as it pertains to uh, electronic air cleaning devices in the previous slide, ASHRAE also published a journal in December of 2018 calling out corona discharge, bipolar, et cetera, and how these air cleaners produce byproducts. Okay, so worth, uh, worth referencing that there as well. Um, going back a little bit more to uh, COVID-19, um, coughing, sneezing, and respiratory droplets are the known roots. Um, direct contact with mouth, nose, or eyes for the other roots as well. But there are possible roots, although there's no evidence for any COVID-19 infection following these roots in commercial buildings is airborne virus particles like in aerosols um, or other yucky stuff there at the bottom that uh, could also spread the disease as well, um, which we are not 100% sure on yet within commercial buildings. So prevention of COVID-19 and how it pertains to HVAC. Can filtration help? Absolutely. So HEPA filters can probably eliminate all airborne viruses. Higher MERV rating, the higher the filtration. Uh, in varied side stream filters are MERV 11 rated. Um, what's interesting to note here is that high levels of PM may actually be a vehicle for COVID transport. So if you're bringing in a lot of outside air, that could actually be detrimental um, to eliminating COVID within a space. UV absolutely works as well. It's proven that it can disinfect the air. Uh, it does need to be properly designed, installed, and maintained with filtration. And humidity control is actually one of the biggest facets behind controlling COVID-19 as, as the research is showing uh, according to this documentation. So does increased ventilation result in faster dilution of these indoor virus aerosols? The answer is no. Uh, relative humidity at 50% is strongly related to virus inactivation. So increasing ventilation will make it harder to keep a building at 50% relative humidity, meaning that increased ventilation, coupled with the fact that you're bringing in more PM uh, to the building, could actually make the situation worse, um, according to these studies. So since PM is a carrier for virus aerosols, increasing ventilation might cause a problem. So um, what's the best thing you can do? Um, obviously controlling humidity within the space, keeping relative humidity near 50% while maintaining comfortable temperatures is ideal for COVID fast inactivation. So if you're bringing in less outside air, in theory, your system should be able to handle uh, keeping relative humidity at 50% easier because you're not potentially bringing in wet, damp, um, humid outside air. World Health Organization's position on airborne transmission as of March 27th, um, and the analysis of 75,000 COVID cases in China, airborne transmission through HVAC was actually not reported, okay? Jumping back into IAQP, uh, Nathan, any other comments there? Is the audio quality a bit better? Audio quality is much better, thanks. Excellent, thank you. With respect to IAQP, let's take a look at the impact of what IAQP does versus ventilation rate procedure. So in a standard office building in this particular case, you might require 2125 CFM of outside air. If you deploy uh, those CO2 sensors within the space that only need to be calibrated once every five years, um, you could use demand control ventilation as a barometer for occupancy and drive down that outside air. But since demand control ventilation has a fixed component behind it uh, surrounding um, square footage, um, you basically the benefit of demand control ventilation floors out at about 30% below ventilation rate procedure. Indoor air quality procedure, since you're actually addressing all the contaminants, including those that are generated from the space itself, uh, the floor in this particular case would be 652 CFM. So over a 75% essentially reduction is not uncommon with the indoor air quality procedure. Basically the lower limits typically are pressurization of the building. That's what outside air is needed for since contamination within the space of CO2, formaldehyde, et cetera, will be controlled by the air cleaning devices. The net result there, this is a 
third party case study by Spectrum Energy, which is an energy modeler um, out of uh, the DC area, Washington DC area. Uh, you can see a life cycle cost analysis here for an office building with a VAV. You can see a VAV RTU without ERV, without energy recovery, one with energy recovery, and finally one with invariant. All these dollar amounts are US dollars, um, but you can see that the equipment cost of these three systems are all pretty much the same, and it's a, a little bit cheaper than with energy recovery. The maintenance costs are actually fairly reasonable and, and indeed potentially less than energy recovery. And the life cycle cost analysis shows almost doubling the amount of savings versus energy recovery because reducing outside air is so more, much more efficient than using energy recovery on that same air. That's just a sample there. Getting a little bit more local, here's a case study at 100 Shepherd Ave East in Toronto. 60% outside air reduction on a single floor, 23,000 square feet, one HLR being used there. 18 ton equivalent reduction in cooling load, 368 MBH of heating load reduction. And the indoor air quality steady state is essentially equivalent to that of ventilation rate procedure, except for reducing outside air by over 15,000 CFM versus what ventilation rate procedure would have been. Okay, so you can see the total square footage, occupancy, VRP outside air, and then a couple columns over the indoor air quality procedure design air outside. So fantastic kind of local case study there in Toronto. Here are the three units we manufacture. There's a very small difference between uh, the two on the left versus the one on the right. The one on the right is our rooftop unit. So it's a down blast configuration that can tap into the return air of a ceiling and plenum. Um, the two on the left, the only difference is, is that one has a singular inlet versus a dual inlet. This is because um, you may need to bring in air uh, for the purposes of regeneration for the unit, which we'll get into in just a moment here. So here's a side view of the box itself. Uh, I mentioned that this is essentially just a very robust filter. And so the natural question is always then, um, you know, what about pressure drop within the system? Uh, well, what we did is we stacked these cartridges in a V-bank formation. So these cartridges are filled with those granules of sorbents that have non-toxic polymers that are able to absorb CO2, formaldehyde, ozone, et cetera. There's 12 of them per box in a vertical V-bank formation. And then the unit has internal fans, just little 120 watt muffin fans to draw 700 to 800 CFM into the unit, run that air over those cartridges, and then return that back to the return air system. We don't want this to be a black box, so we have BACnet integration, so there's a controls board there, so we can connect with the BMS. And then we have sensors within the unit measuring CO2, formaldehyde, uh, excuse me, CO2 total VOCs, which would include formaldehyde, temperature, pressure, humidity. And then we have a total VOC sensor in the space. So you can see that the input sensor, temperature, pressure, um, humidity, and CO2 at the input and the output, um, and then a VOC sensor within the space as well. All this information is broadcast using um, essentially a wireless signal, the 3G, 4G connection. Um, here's the air clean mode, so you can actually see the flow of the air within the unit itself. So with those two little fans and then clean air back into circulation, we're removing CO2, VOCs, formaldehyde, ozone, acids with zero byproducts. Hey, Degeneration. Mm -hmm. You're you're fading a bit again. Okay, no problem. How are you? Thanks. So with regeneration, uh, regeneration is essentially uh, a necessary part of the system because the cartridges um, eventually saturate with CO2. So the genius behind this unit is that we were actually able to figure out a way where if we heated up these cartridges to 130 to 150 degrees Fahrenheit, it would actually release the CO2 that they've captured, okay? So what we do is about once a day for one to three hours, typically during unoccupied hours, the unit will essentially close itself off to the return airstream, and we will heat up these cartridges to 130 to 150 degrees. And then we will purge that air, that warm air that has CO2 in it, through the toilet exhaust or directly outside the building at around 250 CFM. Okay, so we're purging this unit of 
CO2 laden air once we heat up the system above 130 degrees Fahrenheit to purge that air outside of the, the building through the toilet exhaust or directly outside the space. It's just environmental air, so you don't need to do anything special with it, um, but you do need to account for that, and we typically do that during unoccupied hours. In terms of integration, just very quickly here, um, integration with these systems, I frequently get asked, if I don't have a return, how would I integrate this with 100% outside air system? So in this particular case on the left, you have a DOAS with 15,000 CFM of outside air, 15,000 CFM of supply, and you've got energy recovery, treating toilet exhaust and general exhaust. Okay. Um, off to the right here, you've got return air, um, which you would pull from the general exhaust. Okay, so the general exhaust becomes a return now, essentially. The air cleaning modules will scrub a portion of that return and then put that air back into that clean air and return air back into what we call a DCAS, a dedicated clean air system, okay? Uh, that enables you to reduce outside air from that 15,000 number down to 6,500 CFM. Energy recovery can now be completely eliminated or greatly reduced because it's only treating the toilet exhaust. And supply air remains constant so that you can still take advantage of economizer mode, a very much more efficient um, way of designing here. Many of you might not have done this before or worked with Inverid before, so we have quite a bit of free support available. We have um, device specifications, CAD and Revit files, suggested uh, schedules, all to help you essentially drag and drop this onto projects. Um, for your first projects, on-site uh, commissioning assistance is uh, included for free from Inverid as well. Um, so we're happy to uh, come out and make sure that your first projects are successes. This is a snapshot of the compliance report that Inverid can run for you as well. Basically all you do is provide your assumptions that would go into a ventilation rate procedure calculation. So occupancy, square footage, space type. Um, and we can figure out how much outside air to reduce from that space. Um, we spit out a compliance report, we show our calculations, we provide design integration suggestions, and you're off to the races. We also provide some assistance on LEED as well to make sure that those projects are successful. Speaking about LEED, um, the LEED pilot credit for the indoor air quality procedure is EQPC 124. Um, it's basically for providing energy savings and better indoor air quality. We're eligible for this because we also scrub for CO2, which is a requirement of that lead pilot credit. Speaking about the technology just a little bit here. Um, so I mentioned that we do have BACnet integration. Essentially, um, we wanna be able to integrate with the air handler, uh, determine run hours and schedule regeneration during off hours. If it's a 24 seven building, we can stagger regeneration of units during times of lower occupancy. Um, and then also economizer mode, if uh, the air handler and the building is in economizer mode, we will go into standby, okay? So you can still take advantage of those energy savings from economizer mode. Um, data surrounding indoor air quality and unit status can be broadcast by 3G, 4G wireless connection, antennas on the side of the unit. And here's actually a snapshot of an installation that Odell went and visited, the Morgan Stanley Building, uh, their worldwide headquarters in Times Square, New York, where we show unit status, we model in energy savings, and we show CO2 and total VOCs uh, readouts from the sensors uh, in the units and in the space as well. Here's a picture of that installation. You can see that we were actually installed within a mechanical room, which is also a plenum which is why the inlets to the unit are unducted. You can see the large fan wall there off in the upper left-hand corner of the photo to the right. And then that singular duct at the top of the screen is for the regeneration process. So because this system is a 24 seven application, we regenerate these systems, we stagger the regeneration and exhaust that CO2 laden air directly outside the space. Okay, so we're scrubbing the air within the mechanical room um, we're placing that air back into the mechanical room and the fan wall is pulling that cleaner air back through the system. 
The net result there was fantastic indoor air quality within the space, meeting several lead requirements as well, uh, and, and those lead limit standards. We reduced outside air 63% which on this 1.3 million square foot facility meant that we reduced outside air 120,000 CFM. This was a retrofit application that actually paid for itself in less than a year. Thanks also in due part to the utility rebates and measurement and verification that was done. Here's another small project, uh, Conestoga College. It's a six unit, six HLR unit project. Um, where we were actually able to reduce outside air 16,000 CFM with those six units um, out there in uh, Kitchener Market Square. So fantastic, another little local case study for you. In terms of applications, we've mentioned large office buildings. We've also mentioned colleges. Malls and big box stores are great applications, common areas and conference rooms, and obviously lead buildings as well. Basically, anywhere where you're looking to um, reduce outside air, and exhaust is not driving how much outside air is required. So in other words, occupancy should be the driving factor behind your outside air calculations, not exhaust. So generally not good candidates would be hotel guest rooms, hospitals with ASHRAE 170, or kitchens. We might be able to do the cafeteria, which has lower exhaust uh, than the kitchen. We might be able to do the administrative wing of a hospital because those will be classified as offices. And we might be able to do like the ballroom or the common area of the hotel, just not the guest rooms because they have such high exhaust. I mentioned before accommodating increased occupant density is a huge driver for many projects. If you find yourself stuck or it's cost prohibitive to bring in more outside air to a specific project, Inverit can help. Okay. And I mentioned before cooling load reduction. So this is again a spectrum reference in terms of how much uh, load reduction can be achieved with Inverid. It's about 20 ton reduction uh, versus a, a standard system without an ERV and about another five ton push versus um, load with an ERV. So fantastic. Another point of reference here that we are going to be able to increase the amount of reduction of, of cooling equipment size versus energy recovery. Summary of the benefits here, um, you know, typically we try to make sure that every project is both CapEx and OpEx cash positive here. Uh, again, these are US dollars. Um, there's many studies about employee productivity increases due to better indoor air quality. We mentioned LEED as well, and then the validation by the DOE and various utilities as well. Um, we're about 30 minutes in. I'm happy to answer any questions that the audience has or um, expound upon any information that you all would like to hear more about. Yeah, there are uh, there are a few uh, questions here, Ted, so I can uh, maybe get those out there and get those, those ones uh, answered. Um, so the first question is, how are contaminant sources identified as typical? Yeah, so uh, basically the ASHRAE um, has essentially published several studies, and I'll go back here just a couple slides and I'll reference some of these studies. Um, like Wu et al, um, Lead, et cetera, has published certain emission rates based on space types. And so if you're designing a building that's near an unusual source, essentially something that was not assumed within one of these case studies, you can assume that it's an unusual source of contamination. Since when you're looking at essentially the fact that much of our outside air does not meet certain standards, um, like I referenced earlier in the presentation, um, in outside air quality with elevated levels of PM and some of these other things here. Um, you can essentially assume that if you're not meeting minimum standards for outside air requirements, so the conditions of outdoor air non-attainment for NAQS or it's polluted, you could essentially assume that that's not what ASHRAE was intending when publishing the ventilation rate procedure. I think the bigger question is what does uh, quote unquote near mean in terms of unusual sources, right? Does the building need to be right next to the airport? Can it be a mile away? Um, but, um, you know, I think we can all agree that outside air is increasingly polluted. So the indoor air quality procedure is a preferred method since they're saying if you're near any unusual sources, um, you should be calculating outside air based on the indoor air quality procedure. 
Okay, uh, next question. How much do the replaceable cartridges cost? Um, so that's, uh, I'm assuming they're talking about the, yeah, the, the uh, absor absorption material. Yeah, it typically varies based on project scope. Um, Odell can absolutely help you price that out, but our goal again is to keep these projects OPEX cash flow positive. Um, so on average per unit, I don't know, Nathan, you can you can answer that question. Yeah, I think we it's it's around twenty five hundred dollars annually um, to maintain a single um, single unit, uh, which works out. I think you've talked in the past that uh, about thirty percent of the energy savings associated with the, unit, the equipment. So, um, okay. So next question: Does the CO two sensor inside the HLR unit need calibration? How often? Yeah, so we use five-year sensors on our internal sen uh, CO2 sensors. Yeah. Um, what capacity are the heaters inside the unit? Great question. So the heaters are six and a half kilowatt electric uh, heaters, um, and they typically run from one to three hours per day. So the parasitic load of these devices is actually fairly low compared to how much energy they're saving by reducing outside air. Um, and the last question that's on this chart right now is, can the air downstream of the HLR be classified as ASHRAE class one? Um, so uh, class one is, um, I believe class one air is like standard indoor air. And I believe the answer is yes. Yeah. Okay. Um, that's all the questions that we have at the moment. So is there, you can, you can carry on, Ted, if you got more to, more to talk about. Excellent. Um, I just have a couple of additional case studies. I'm happy to expound on any additional information regarding the classification of um, uh, air. So basically, it, uh, I just want to revisit that question briefly again, make sure I answered it fully. So um, during the regeneration cycle, when you're purging the system of that regeneration air, no additional treatment needs to be done. That air is the same as any other exhaust air. Uh, from within the space. It's not considered to be contaminated in any any shape or form. So no post-treatment is required. It's just standard air that has a little bit elevated levels of CO2, um, which means that no downstream post-treatment is required. Um, same as any other indoor air that would be exhausted from the space uh, that is not contaminated. Um, just kind of wrapping up here, I wanted to make sure that we spoke about things like, um, you know, VRV applications. We covered VAV before, but uh, we're still very attractive in terms of case studies from a life cycle cost analysis showing over twice as high total life cycle cost analysis savings versus VRV applications with energy recovery. Um, so this can be applied off of, of a variety of solutions, including VAV, VRV, et cetera. Um, Here's an example of a tonnage reduction. Where are you achieving these first cost savings? Dedicated outside air systems can be essentially turned into package research systems if you're reducing outside air significantly enough. Chiller sizing can come down. Uh, ERVs can be eliminated um, or greatly reduced. And then uh, various duct sizes can also be shrunk as well. Um, we do have, as mentioned before, um, various uh, HLR rebates as well for CapEx reductions. Some other kind of larger scope projects that we have as well. Uh, this is one from the Department of Energy um, that we worked with them before, University of Miami Student Center. Uh, this is a new project that's going to be constructed in 2021. We've already worked on campus with them on their um, essentially health buildings. They're basically just gyms and standard offices. They're not ASHRAE 170 um, spaces, but um, we modulated essentially um, the unit on and off on a retrofit application, uh, measured enthalpy, which we remained relatively consistent in Miami, and then showed the energy savings. The blue lines are without the HLR and the green lines are with the HLRs on over a several year period to validate with the DOE our energy savings. We do a lot of work with K through 12 schools. Um, and so you can see some of the examples here in Pennsylvania, Virginia, uh, and the DC areas as well. Um, we also do work on historic buildings and museums. So this is a museum in downtown DC where we had a 65% outside air reduction. 
uh, very high occupancy, and uh, we're able to reduce the amount of outside air there uh, pretty significantly with AHLRs. So this is another example where we actually ran out of dimensional space in the mechanical rooms, and the building was looking to increase occupancy. So by incorporating HLRs, they were actually able to downsize equipment, fit it into the mechanical rooms, um, and also achieve some first cost savings there as well. And then I mentioned WeWork as well. This particular WeWork application was eligible for around seven lead points. On average, we're providing between six and nine lead points on that pilot credit um, and incorporated four HLRs there. So Nathan, I just wanted to cover those kind of quick case studies there, um, in addition to some of the work that we've done uh, in, uh, in the Greater Toronto area and Ontario. Happy to answer any further questions and uh, I appreciate the time today. Thank you so much. Uh, yeah, I'm just checking here um, to see if there's any further questions that have come up. Um, and it doesn't uh, look like there's any new questions. And uh, unless I can give everybody about a minute here to, to post a question if you have any questions. Otherwise, that'll uh, that'll uh, conclude the, the webinar for today. So just wait another minute here. All right. Well, it looks like uh, looks like that's all the questions for today. Um, Ted, uh, again, thank you very much for taking the time to present to us today. Um, I will be posting this webinar um, online uh, on our website. So if you want to uh, review it in the future, you, you're more than welcome to do that. Um, and uh, sorry, there is one question that came in here. Um, and I'll, uh, I'll, I'll ask you here. So for a building with highly variable ventilation air rates like a lecture hall and classrooms, would the HLR unit be used to reduce base load ventilation or would it be better to have HLR cycled on when additional ventilation is required for higher space occupancy? Yeah, what a great question. So we love auditoriums, churches, places with highly variable um, occupancy. And part of the reason behind that is because our units are typically always running, uh, essentially scrubbing air within the space as emissions are released from uh, contaminants that are in the space itself, not just occupancy. So what you end up with there is very clean air from a formaldehyde perspective and some of the other contaminants that you typically see um, that you might not be reducing as much with perhaps demand control ventilation. Um, and so we're eliminating a lot of those nasty contaminants. And then we're also removing CO2 from the essentially just air within the space prior to occupancy, full occupancy. So we're essentially sub cleaning the space and you can see really clean air when the, when the space does not have uh, maximum design occupants. We always design to worst case scenario. You can design using an occupancy diversity factor using similar assumptions to what you would be doing during ventilation rate procedure. Um, but those spaces are great applications for us to help you reduce tonnage um, and total amount of outside air there. If you have specific projects in mind, please provide those to Odell. Um, include the assumptions that you would typically incorporate with VRP or include your ventilation rate procedure calculations, square footage, space type, occupancy um, are typically the big ones, whether or not it's a lead project, and we can spit out a compliance report for you typically within 72 uh, hours, which is a fantastic turn time, and also provide design integration suggestions as well. Um, oh, sorry, another question here. How do you know how much to reduce the outside air when using Invirid? Yeah, absolutely. So uh, essentially, there's been decades and decades of studies from ASHRAE that publish emission rates of CO2 and contaminants. Um, using the mass balance equation that we referenced earlier on in the presentation, it's actually a very straightforward calculation where we, for all the contaminants of concern, um, we do a calculation on those contaminants for CO2, formaldehyde, benzene, ozone, et cetera. Um, with the ASHRAE stated emission rates based off of their studies over the past several decades. 
um, as well as space type. So we correlate that to space type. And then we know the air cleaning efficiency of our device with no byproducts because of the ASHRAE 145.2 testing. So it's a very simple mass balance equation on each of the contaminants, um, as well as compared to our cleaning solution. You're still bringing in some outside air for the purposes of building pressurization, and that puts out how much outside air you can reduce. Um, it is like a it is like a two lever system in the fact that if you wanted to incorporate fewer HLRs, fewer invariant units, um, you could do that and you could design for a building to have more outside air, or you could try to drive that outside air down to minimum by incorporating more HLRs. So it's not one or the other, it's essentially a combination of outside air and HLRs. On average, we see about a 60% reduction in outside air um, for one HLR for every uh, 150 to 180 occupants. The reason why I mentioned occupancy is because it's based on um, the amount of CO2 produced. That's really the only thing that can saturate our cartridges. So we designed to occupancy because we know our efficiency of scrubbing for formaldehyde and ozone, et cetera, is so very high. So we're very efficient at scrubbing the really nasty stuff. It's really only CO2 that limits our ability to reduce outside air. And then I'll, that's also why we go into regeneration every once in a while. I think there's a follow-up question. How does that translate to actual building CFM during operation? Um, yeah, so I, I think you might have answered that near the end there when you, you talked about uh, reducing the ventilation air required for um, between 150 to 180 people. Um, yep. So. Exactly right. Yep. So it's typically about a 60% reduction per HLR um, if the occupancy is, you know, standard office application for around 15,000 square feet. Yeah. From the from the applications we've looked at um, in a standard office facility, we, we generally are able to reduce ventilation loads to uh, just be pressurization requirements. So um, your ventilation becomes uh, set by how much exhaust you need for other other things like bathrooms um, within the facility so yeah and from the case studies that we looked at that works out to be anywhere between 1500 cfm to 3000 cfm reduced per hlr yeah okay uh there is another question uh following Great. up on your how near is to near to an unusual source to determine the answer to that with ashray 62.1 are physical contaminant measurements taken on the site to determine how close it is to close? <laughs> yeah, so um, we can do that. Um, you're supposed to do that for ventilation rate procedure every time. So you're actually supposed to reference outside air quality, even if you're doing a ventilation rate procedure. Um, you're supposed to reference other buildings that were designed in the area and the outside air quality samples that were taken at that time. Or you're supposed to do outside air testing. That's not something that many folks actually know. Um, in specific areas where we're curious about outside air quality, uh, Breezometer can actually provide printouts of outside air quality. That's not actually a requirement of the indoor air quality procedure per se to um, provide that data during calculations. Um, but um, you know, you can do outside air sampling through Breezometer. Um, for fairly inexpensive and get uh, outside air quality measurements. That being said, um, if outside air quality is questionable, um, you are supposed to use the indoor air quality procedure. So if you're in your mind right now saying, what's an unusual source or how close is too close? Um, according to this statement by ASHRAE, you're supposed to use the indoor air quality procedure. And I'll just pull up that verbiage once again for everybody so you can look at it. Don't get dizzy. And there it is. For sources that are not typical of occupancy, the additional ventilation or air cleaning required must be calculated using the indoor air quality procedure. Very exciting stuff here for both in Barrett and you know, the efficiency of buildings, essentially 62.1 
pushing you towards the indoor air quality procedure if you're unsure or there's unusual sources nearby. Okay, well that looks like that's all the questions. Um, appreciate all the questions everybody. Those are always great uh, to get some feedback on, on what, uh, what questions you may have about the technology and about how you use the IAQP. Um, feel free to reach out to any of the Odell uh, salespeople or myself. If you have anything, you, any direct questions you wanna ask, um, any further questions or any applications, we're, we're more than happy to help you um, with uh, pulling together details on how much ventilation load you can actually save um, and what that translates into uh, as far as capital costs, uh, capital cost savings, as well as energy savings uh, for, for life of the building. Um, anyways, uh, again, thanks to everybody for attending and uh, that'll conclude our webinar. Thank you.